Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, episode 15 of the Pain Consultants USA podcast. Um, I'm here again with Dr. Connor, and today we'll talk about uh, a question that we get asked pretty frequently in our clinics. Uh, it's whether or not a patient should go to a chiropractor for the problem that they're having. Um, so, uh, Dr. Connor, should they go to a chiropractor? <laughs> uh, well, the, the answer is complex, but uh, I, I think it can. Uh, there's definitely a role uh, to for our chiropractic colleagues to uh, assist in management of multiple musculoskeletal and pain issues. And I think the purpose of today, we should kind of dive into you know what those roles are. Maybe when should patients. Um, uh, be cautious about using them, those types of things. Yeah. So I think we both agree, you know, we have a lot of, we share, we share patients with lots of other practitioners, you know, other physicians who do similar work, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgical spine surgeons, um, anesthesiologists who manage pain, just like us in physical medicine and rehabilitation, physical therapists, occupational therapists, acupuncturists, massage therapists, chiropractors. There's a long list of people that share similar types of patients in painful conditions. And, you know, everyone has a role to play in the management of that care. And, um, you know, chiropractors definitely have a role to play. And, um, you know, sometimes um, they get a bad rap for certain things. But, um, you know, I think we both find them very valuable um, as, as part of the continuum of care for, for our patients, because as we talk about frequently, a lot of our patients are very complicated. And so anything that's safe while also being effective, you know, is a great thing to add to a, to a treatment regimen for, for patients that we deal with. So, um, uh, I guess first, maybe we could talk a little bit about so people know, because I don't think even people know uh, kind of what what kind of education chiropractors go through. Um, and it's something that, you know, I wasn't too aware of, but did some reading about, um, you know, I think we were just talking about a little bit ago how uh, chiropractors uh, generally first complete under undergraduate degrees, although I don't think it's uh, required. They have to complete a certain amount of credit hours as an undergraduate, um, but most of them probably do acquire a bachelor degree. Um, and uh, some states for, who license chiropractors, they do require a bachelor's degree. And then they would typically go on to uh, school for a doctor of chiropractic degree. Um, and there is a, uh, there's a, uh, the Council on Chiropractic Education that kind of gives those schools accreditation. And from just looking at their website, I think we can find that there's about 16 of those schools currently in the United States. Um, so um, my take would be that generally chiropractors complete a college education uh, and then they would go on to one of these schools and uh and those programs tend to be somewhere between three and four years long and they include a lot of science courses and then a lot of training and uh in you know the specific kind of treatments that the, that a chiropractor might do in the clinic uh and then from there uh there it looks like there are some residency programs as well now for md like me or a do like dr connor uh, we we have to go to four years of medical school and then go into residency for kind of our specific uh, training after or like kind of our in clinic hands on training after medical school. Uh, it doesn't look like that's necessarily required for chiropractors, but um, they can go to certain residency programs to to better specialize uh, within a certain field uh, in chiropractic care um, and. Uh, and then it looks like once you kind of complete that schooling, you can kind of go out and practice and uh, and begin uh, giving these treatments that we'll we'll talk about a little more. Um, Dr. Connor, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of what maybe is the main type of treatment modalities that chiropractors use? Well, I, th I think we all think of the the classic kind of manipulation where you know you're getting uh, cracked you know, whether it's in the, the cervical, thoracic or lumbar spine. 
but a lot of uh, chiropractors, uh, I believe, also utilize and incorporate different modalities into their treatment, uh, uh, whether, you know, TENS, uh, hot packs, uh, some will utilize traction as well, depending on um, the, you know, the injury or the body part that they're treating. Uh, and you, I hear and I see some different facilities, you know, they take a more, um, natural route or they'll also practice a lot of holistic treatments and, um, you know, well, we could get into all supplements and, uh, and that side of it as well. But, um, it's usually a combination of, uh, modality based, uh, uh treatment, uh, heat, tens, uh, massage, uh, as well as the kind of hands-on manipulation. And, is there a certain type of patient that you think about getting to a chiropractor like pretty quickly for treatment when you see a certain type of patient? Yeah, I mean, I, when uh, one big group of patients that I see a lot that I, I feel benefit are like the MVA patients, so patients that are involved in motor vehicle accidents. Most uh, times you're going to have a combination of some neck discomfort and back pain afterwards. Um, so some of those modalities that we talked about, you know, again, uh, the heat, the tens, massage, uh, uh, different, um, what I would call passive based treatments where, you know, the patient's not actively doing exercise is not a bad thing, especially mm -hmm. in the acute situation and can be, uh, can feel quite, quite good for the patients. Right. Uh, and it, give some time for the natural healing process to occur. So that kind of subgroup of patients, um, I'll refer quite a bit. Um, you know, when I see patients for the first time with, uh, what I feel is likely sacroiliac joint issues, uh, I like them, uh, for, to see the chiropractor as well. You know, with sacroiliac joint, there's a lot of, um, subtle findings such as, you know, the, the hips or what we call the anominance, right? The pelvic bones that attach to the SI joint, uh, can have some subtle rotation, um, because they are connected by ligaments. Uh, so oftentimes kind of making sure those are aligned as well as the, the, the junction between the lumbar spine and the sacrum. Um, you know, I think, uh, from my background as an osteopath, right, we're trained to do a lot of manual therapies, uh, and there can be some some inner there's connection between what the chiropractors may do and, and us. I think we, uh, osteopaths probably also learn some other kind of non manipulative uh, techniques uh, to treat a lot of uh, conditions. Um, as well as maybe more of a emphasis on the, the diagnostic side of it, but uh, in addition to just normal medicine. Um, but, you know, it's hard to find osteopaths that do manual therapy outside of academic centers. So uh, I know in the region I, I practice currently, and um, there's not too many osteopaths around that, that do that. Uh, most just practice what we would call traditional medicine. So, um, you know, for those reasons, I'll rely on, on our chiropractic colleagues. Yeah. So, uh, I just wanted to kind of add on to what you were saying there a little bit. I think, you know, I think chiropractic care is typically thought of as part of this world of kind of complementary and alternative medicine. And so that may be, uh, one reason why you may see a lot of kind of naturopathic treatments with chiropractors and, and other similar, um, methods. Um, and, um, there was one other thing. Oh, well, you mentioned kind of the similarity with osteopathic care. And I think that was part of kind of how chiropractic care was developed. It was meant to be a combination of osteopathic care and, a, and physical therapy and, and sort of kind of a few different things and kind of bringing them together. Um, and it's it's really a relatively recent um, a recent discipline. You know, it's it's only developed really in 1895. So, you know, some 125 years ago. Uh, so it's it's still pretty new, and I'm sure they're still getting better at kind of honing in how to treat conditions and and 
and and what conditions can really really benefit from it um i was reading a bit about the beginning of it it's you know it sounded like uh, a guy named daniel david palmer in in kind of they say invented uh, chiropractic care in in davenport iowa in 1895 and so uh, it's clearly grown very big since uh since since that time um you know what's interesting uh, i was kind of curious you know how many chiropractors are there because i i feel like even in the the area i am every, every there's a lot of chiropractors around or you talk to different patients they have a chiropractor it's always a different one so yeah. this was at least uh 2018 numbers um uh, there's a quote of over 95,000 chiropractors which That's which seems lot. seems like a lot right i mean you compare yeah. that to I, I think there's from uh, orthopedic surgeon standpoint i think maybe 30,000 and yeah uh, you know our specialty physical medicine rehabilitation i think a couple of years back i think the numbers were eight or nine thousand so you know, interesting that's uh, yeah. a lot of yeah. chiropractors out there well you know and they're I, they're definitely out on the front lines of care i mean i definitely see a lot of patients who go see a chiropractor before they see a, a physician and you know a lot of times patients end up choosing who they go to. They may go to a physical therapist first. They may go to a chiropractor first. They may have gotten in a car accident. Uh, in Florida, there, there's a business that has billboards everywhere and there's a phone number on it and people can call that number and it's made for people who like get in car accidents. But the whole thing is driven around kind of driving patients to, I believe they get driven to chiropractors first. Um, but then all other disciplines of care too. But, um, you know, it just probably depends where you live and how it's advertised and how you grew up. And if you knew someone who got better from a chiropractor, they're probably going to send you to see a chiropractor. If they tell, if you're, you're like, Hey, you know, I've been dealing with this neck pain. You ever had this? Oh yeah. I went and saw this chiropractor. He was great. And then, you know, a lot of times you'll end up going there first before you end up seeing one of us for one of these problems. Um, and a lot of times people will get better and won't even need to come see us, which, you you know, it was great. Um, and then, you know, we're definitely here to help when someone doesn't get better. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's very interesting number. There's may, maybe 10 times or 11 times the amount of chiropractors as there is physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians. And then, I mean, if you think about it, like how many physical medicine rehabilitation physicians are really treating these kinds of conditions, there's a lot of us are out there in the inpatient rehabilitation world kind of doing different kind of work. So, you know, what is that? Maybe two thirds yeah. or three quarters of those. So it's an even lower number. Uh, but, you know, one thing about kind of chiropractors and physical therapists is their, their jobs are based around kind of hands on care um, at repeated sessions. And we're a little different in the sense that like, if you come see me, you know, the earliest follow up I'm going to give you based on either ordering some imaging or some, 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 uh, some treatment is probably, you know, maybe sometimes one week, but usually two weeks. Um, whereas you see a chiropractor, you might be seeing that person four or five times a week for a few weeks, a physical therapist, a lot of times it's like three times a week. Um, so you can see that there might be or a, a need or a perceived need to have more of these practitioners available because their hours are taken up, hopefully delivering hands-on care to a single patient for, for, for a significant period of time to help them recover from that injury. You know, whereas we're kind of um, more in that aspect, directing the care. And I don't want to say we're not hands-on, but we're not, my job is not to, be there with the patient for an hour three times a week that's you know so maybe i'm not maybe there isn't required to be as many of us i don't know i don't know what you think about that yeah no i mean i i think that's a good point um uh, you know i i think just like any other specialty though when when there's so many providers out there and just like any field i mean there's going to be really good ones and then there's going to be not so good ones and yeah with numbers this high, 
you know, you could see why there's a lot of different stories out there about some some good experiences and not. And then that shapes kind of the opinion of people. It kind of shapes the talking points on the, the profession and field in general as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think we see that, you know, I see people who see chiropractors. My one of my best friends just the other week told me that his low back was hurting him and he saw a chiropractor and he wasn't really sure if he should be seeing a chiropractor. And so I asked him why he went to a chiropractor in the first place. Why didn't he just call me? Because he knows what I do. And, you know, he said some friend sent him to the chiropractor and said the chiropractor was great. So he went to the chiropractor and he was getting treatments that, you know, it sounded like he was getting a little, uh, some electrical stimulation. He was getting hot packs and he was getting a little bit of manipulation while he was there. And, um, he really, he said he'd feel better for, you know, maybe an hour after the treatment. And then really the pain would just be the same as before. And, and I said, you know, if you've been to three, four sessions and that's really your kind of how you're doing, then I would say that you're not really improving. And I would say that you probably don't need to keep going if he's not, if the chiropractor is not going to change what he's doing to you and, uh, to try and, to try and make you feel better sooner. And so, and then he said, well, there's a whole setup at the office where he had to prepay for like 12 visits or 20 visits or something. And, and it was this whole kind of business plan. And so, you know, I said, look, that's just like red flag sign. So that's, you know, things that we need to look out for. If they're trying to loop you into like some repetitive visit system where it's not a concern whether or not you're really getting better, that's a red flag that maybe they're more concerned about the business than the actual patient. And so we need to find a chiropractor who's who's not like that and not just focused on kind of collecting your money before you've even had these visits to, to get better. So um, I don't know. Uh, he wasn't even sure if he was going to be able to, to get his money back for the rest of the visits, but, uh, but he was going to try, but you know, I just, uh, we can talk about more signs like that, but, and it's just like that with any healthcare pr practitioner. If you don't think that they have your best interest in mind, your best interest is your health and your fun in our world, your function and your pain control. And if that's not improving, something needs to be changed or, um, you know, uh, you need to try, try different, different practitioners or different treatments, you know? Yeah. There, there's a lot of different business models you'll see with, uh, chiropractic care. Um, you know, they could range from, you know, just billing insurance. So you'll pay your standard copay and, uh, then the office will bill your insurance based on, you know, as long as your, your insurance provides a coverage or, um, uh, you'll hear just cash base, you know, each time you go, you just pay a certain amount if they're not uh, on par with your insurance. And then you'll get into some of these elaborate business plans as far as, okay, yeah, you pay for the uh, 20 visits up front, the first week or two, it might be four times, and it goes to three times, two times, and then there's a maintenance, you know, once or twice a week for 12 weeks. Um, I've actually, I've been to one of those. Oh, this is a long time ago. Um, but, you know, to my knowledge, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of, you know, benefit one way over the other as far as repeated treatments uh, versus intermittent. Uh, I don't have a great scientific reason behind this, but I tell most of my patients, if you don't, and this is similar to you, but if you don't get benefit within six sessions um, and nothing's changing, then I probably, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't keep going. Right. I mean, I, I, I view kind of uh, uh, chiropractic uh, partly, you know, to help um, uh, restore normal kind of alignment, uh, which then hopefully will translate into uh, restoring function. But for the most part, unless this is a, uh, an acute injury, like we said, you know, car accident a couple of days ago um, or slip and fall a few days ago. You know, this really treatment needs to be coupled with a more active based uh, approach as well. So exercise is going to be important as well. So so if there's none of that involved in your treatment plan, um, 
you know, you, you kind of have to reevaluate what you're doing. And it, so if patient's not motivated or they don't exercise to begin with, uh, and they're just relying on chiropractors or the treatment provided in the office to be, to have sustained relief and it's not, then, you know, things need to change. So whether that might be to focus more on a physical therapy approach where you're going to be doing more exercise. Um, but it always comes back to the patient. I mean, you have to put in the work. Um, you know, I think to hit on one of your other points, as far as, um, you know, with your, your buddy there, um, how many sessions did he go for? You said, I think he went to like six or seven. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I would agree if things didn't get better, then I'd be looking for an alternative approach. But with some of these elaborate business models, patients, you have to in healthcare anymore, you have to be your own best advocate. And, yeah. you know, if something kind of sounds a little, little weird, uh, don't agree to it. You know, yeah. I mean, um, uh, unlike some consumer businesses, right. I mean, there is no guarantee, uh, with, you know, the way you're going to respond to a treatment. So if they're not guaranteeing you your money back, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, commit to such an upfront cost. Um, cause there's, there's good chiropractors that, that don't, uh, take that approach as well. Right. I think another, uh, red flag related to his experience was, uh, he told me that the chiropractor told him that he had one of the most damaged spines he had ever seen. And he's like a 35 year old guy with probably very mild disc degeneration. And, you know, that's just normal, really normal findings on, on imaging of a, of a 35 year old, you, you can definitely see some disc degeneration and he had some very mild scoliotic curve in the thoracic spine. And, it just really, you know, it, it's a red flag if someone's trying to convince you how bad your spine looks. If your spine really looks that bad, you know, you'd really want to get to see a, a spine physician sooner rather than later, and they should be sending you to that person. But um, the fact that he was trying to convince him of how bad it looked, we don't really care. We don't care too much about what the images show. Uh, um, you know, unless they've really, really something on there really correlates with exactly where your pain is. You know, there's a lot of things that we see on images that just aren't related to what's happening in the patient. And so someone trying to convince you that your images look terrible and that that's a reason for you to get more uh, treatment in regarding any kind of spine condition is is not is not uh, really good practice. You know, the the findings that on the imaging need to correlate with where the problem is. And then we can pinpoint, Hey, this, this imaging finding correlates with this problem. Okay. This is why we need to treat this, you know, but just taking generic x-rays of your, uh, entire spine and then telling you your spine looks terrible. That's really not good practice. And I, I would say that that, you know, that would be a sign to me that you really should kind of look elsewhere for treatment. And that was one sign that he told me that I was like, look, he, he and then he sent me the x-rays and they looked, you know, pretty much fine. It was totally yeah. fine. So, um, and I, and I explained that to him. I was like, look, he told you, you know, the wrong thing. You, your spine looks fine. You're going to get better. And he stopped going and he ended up getting better within two weeks because, yeah. You know, he made a few changes and most people just get better within four to six weeks anyway. That, I mean, that's I mean, that's true. I mean, with c certain conditions, if you seek treatment right away, I mean, and you do get better within that time frame, is it the treatment that did it or is it the natural healing process? You know, I guess it's tough to know. Um, uh, I would agree with imaging, right? Anytime we're talking about imaging, especially with spine, um, you know, we don't treat the images, we treat the patient and the symptoms. So we know, and we've talked about this, you can have yeah. tons of findings on MRI, x-ray that don't correlate with any symptoms or injury that you may have sustained. Um, so again, you have to be careful relying uh, strictly on imaging um, to kind of give you a prognosis. Yeah. Um, I think patients, and I think it's natural human tendency, you always focus on like the worst things, right? So 
I think healthcare uh, providers do a disservice to patients when we really focus on the negatives, uh, or we we say, "Oh my God, your spine uh, looks terrible," or this you know disc is destroyed, or or whatever the terminology may be, because we'll see patients months or years down the road, and they're still holding on to that that phrase or thought that um, uh, they were told, "Oh my God, this is." my spine looks like a 60 year old, you know, yeah, if yeah, 20 or 30 sure. or, or I was told that, you know, this is out of place and, and, you know, it's really hard to get that out of your mind. And then any little ache and pain you feel, you, you remember what was told to you and then you're, you're thinking, Oh my God, I have no chance or, yeah. you know, and then there's, it kind of keeps that whole cycle going. So yeah. I think really kind of, there's a disservice done to patients when we really focus on, um, uh, or kind of exaggerate the negative findings, whether it be for, uh, the purpose of, um, advancing your, your business agenda. Yeah. I really try to make a point about being positive about the images and saying, look, the point of this x-ray was to look at the alignment of the spine and then also rule out any fractures or major lesions in the bone. You don't have any fractures. You don't have any major lesions. The alignment looks good. You have some degenerative changes that are associated with kind of chronic arthrit arthritic changes or some wording like that. And, um, and that is relatively normal for someone your age to have findings like this. Um, we could debate about whether or not it's normal to have degeneration over time. If you're very active and exercise appropriately, maybe you won't have those degenerative changes, but for the average person, it's probably, we could just call it that it's the usual finding that you'll have degenerative changes in your spine. And so let's emphasize the, the good part and say that, look, it doesn't look terrible. And uh, we have a, you know, a good chance to make you feel better. Terminology, I think, is really important. And, I, and I, I do think there is a big difference in terminology used by some chiropractors uh, and, uh, you know, physicians that, that treat kind of spine related stuff. For example, I'll hear a lot of patients using the words or being told, you know, there's a subluxation or uh, disc is out of place or, or you know I, I, things that i think they take one way yeah. where it's really meant a, a different way so if somebody tells you something's out of place i mean they're in the spine you can get the intersegmental motion and differences right and this goes back to my osteopathic um, training right um it's based on the feel of tissue and tissue texture changes and, and the way you feel like you can um, uh, measure intersegmental motion with subtle rotation, maybe side bending and whether a, a specific segment of the spine likes flexion or extension a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's really kind of getting into the weeds. But if it doesn't mean that the segment, whether uh, including the vertebrae or the disc is out of place, it doesn't mean it it slipped and it, you're trying to get it back into place. It, it doesn't mean that, um, based on what you, you typically would think, um, you know, if something was to move, you could visualize it. These are not uh, visual things for the most part. These are more kind of, uh, texture changes and, and fine little movements that you feel with your hands. So, you know, I think that's something else to be uh, cognizant of. Yeah, I, mean, I don't yeah, know. I think the... are, are you aware of any other terms that, no, I think the subluxation terms. is like the main is a main like kind of tenant of chiropractic care. They talk a lot about subluxations. I think I don't know for sure, but I think it's also been shown that, you know, if like the that chiropractors trying to call subluxations by looking at x-rays has really been shown to not be consistent. So if a chiropractor looks at an x-ray and say, hey, you have these subluxations here at T7, L1, L3, that's that's not, uh, it's been shown that that's probably not able to be consistently done. Um, you know, different chiropractors would all say different things. They've done studies to kind of assess that. Um, so that shouldn't be uh, something that, that 
a chiropractor is telling you. Um, yeah. Let me let me jump in there. Hold your yeah. thoughts. Sorry. Yeah. I'll give you my own personal experience. So this was, yeah. oh gosh, this has to be close to I don't know, 15 years ago, right? So uh, I was much younger and uh, my back was hurt. And so I went to a chiropractor that was in, in our local area. So this is, I guess I was in college at this time. Uh, and they do a consult. They had this concept of, okay, you're going to do a series of visits. The consult um, at the time consisted of me going into a room. They took just st like standing x-rays of the spine, just one view. So like just a straight on shot. They put them up on, on the little uh, board so you can see the light board. And he looks at them and then, you know, he runs his hands down the back of my spine in a seated position. And he starts blurting out all this stuff. Oh, yeah. T4 rotated right, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this sublux, like you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then he devised a whole treatment plan based on that kind of 15-minute uh, encounter. Back then, I, I didn't know any different, right? I mean, right. looking back now, it's actually pretty comical, right? I mean, what was that? That was that that was bullshit i mean you know i mean looking back yeah. um so if you have encounters like that where they'll take a ap shot or so they'll just have you stand and they take a straight on x-ray of your whole spine and like you said they sit you down they tell you oh this is out of place this is out of place they run their hands up and down your spine whether you're sitting or laying and it's everything's boom 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 uh, that's bullshit so yeah. um you know i, I just hey. like yeah, I was just going to say, I think, you know, part of this is just like when you go to any medical practitioner, there should be a thorough history and evaluation. So they need to know about your his medical history because there are things that make you, you uh, contraindicated to have uh, manipulative chiropractic care. Um, and they need to know uh, to make sure that you don't have certain conditions based on your history before they start doing things. And so like Dr. Connor's describing a 15 minute evaluation with a single X-ray um, AP, meaning just looking front to back at his spine and not looking at it sideways or bending over and leaning backwards, you know, one single X-ray just doesn't tell a, tell a story. You need multiple views to really tell a story. And, and a 15 minute evaluation where you just run the hand down the spine and talk about, Oh, like this vertebral segments rotated this way. You know, maybe if you're doing a, an hour evaluation where you're feeling out the different segments of the spine and seeing how they move and things, yeah, that, that could be, you know, that would be more realistic to make determinants like that. But that's just, it's just, you know, it's very obviously not good care. Yeah. And the, and the purpose isn't to bash the field, but I think what one of our goals with this podcast and, you know, we want to hold uh, medical professionals accountable, right? So when you look at management of chronic pain, it can be a big business, right? Right. Um, right. There's a lot of people who suffer with it. So there's a lot of great doctors and providers out there and there's a lot of shady ones. So we want to hold the shady ones and everyone really accountable to it. So right. if these are your experiences uh, with your providers, I mean, you know what, in all honesty, I mean, I find a new provider. Yeah. I mean, this is the same with physicians. I mean, I see patients all the time who see me for a painful problem and I examine them and they're like, you're the first doctor that's put their hands on me. And it's like, well, that's not really appropriate. Like if you're treating someone's pain, you probably need to at least do one or two things where you put your hand on them to move the joint or to feel the spinal segment or something to, to kind of figure out where you think the pain is coming from uh, in an in-person evaluation. Um, you know, through telemedicine, we're trying to work that out with patients kind of doing it themselves uh, with our guidance. But if you're in an in-person evaluation, there's no reason not to, to feel the patient and, uh, and, and feel where you think the problem is exactly. And so, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's just, it's, I, I guess what we're saying is, you know, 
if you're getting uh, care that isn't up to standards, you know, search it out because it's out there. There's there's very good practitioners all throughout the medical system, but there are also practitioners who uh, who use the system to as a as a business um, entity, and and it's unfortunate. It, patients suffer because of it. Yeah, gives everyone a bad name. Yeah, um, you you and alluded- it's given chiropractors a bad name in some sense, you know, I think Mm -hmm. they, you know, people don't know what to think about chiropractors and our, you know, I guess our suggestion overall is seek out a good one who evaluates you and cares about how you feel and, and helps you and wants to help you. And don't want all your money up front. Right. Uh, so, so uh, let's talk about, let's expand on the the contraindications or maybe reasons why you shouldn't get, um, I guess, manipulation with the chiropractor, right? So soft tissue, right. we're not talking so much about soft tissue, maybe a little bit of traction, massage, that type of stuff, but the actual, what we would term like high velocity, low amplitude uh, manipulation where you might hear or feel a pop in, in your spine. Um, you know, some of the things uh, like the textbook answers would be, you know, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, You don't want somebody uh, manipulating your neck um, due to kind of um, the changes um, high up in your cervical spine um, where your spinal cord kind of exits the the brain and the brain stem. Um, That could be there could be a serious issue there. People who are very hypermobile, again, uh, whether it's through like a Elo Stanlos or even some like hereditary hypermobility syndromes might be another reason not to get cracked. Um, personally, I'm not, I tell my patients who have a lot of stenosis or, or uh, narrowing, whether in the center part of their uh, spine or uh, where the nerves exit. So what we call neuroforaminal stenosis. Sometimes I, I'm a little cautious with regards to um, those high velocity, low amplitude movements. Uh, I feel like they can potentially aggravate the pain. Um, severe arthritis with very restricted active range of motion. So if patients can only turn their head this far and you look at x-rays and just it's just osteophytes or severe arthritis in these you know 70 80 90 year old patients um, they may not be the the best candidate for a manipulation where passively right somebody else is taking you beyond your range of motion restrictions because um, that can cause an uh, exacerbation or aggravation of the pain uh, and then or, or I guess what else any other ones jump out at you um you know, I think there's a pretty thorough list on the uh, World Health Organization kind of guidelines for chiropractic care. So patients, you can kind of search that out if you need to. Uh, I think you kind of went through some of the main ones. Um, one thing in regards to you were just talking about cervical spine manipulation that I like to tell patients is, look, if you don't have a, a problem where the pain is in your neck or your upper back, Uh, you probably shouldn't allow anyone to adjust your neck. And, you know, generally chiropractic care is very safe, uh, but there have been reports of very bad things that can happen. And most of those are probably related to adjustments of the cervical spine or the neck. So I would just stay away from that if that's not where a problem area for you at all, just at, you know, Know, ask the chiropractor to just avoid that because if you have a manipulation there, you have a disc herniation that it hits your spinal cord or you have a dissection of your vertebral artery, it could be very bad for you. And it's probably just not worth the very small risk of that happening to have that manipulation if you're not really having any problem in that area. Yeah. And, you know, if you do undergo a cervical manipulation and soon thereafter you develop you know, whether arm or leg weakness or change in the sensation in an extremity or balance, really bad headache, bad headache, balance difficulty, maybe blurred vision or one eye looks a little droopy compared to the other or even difficulty with speech. I mean, for those reasons, I mean, you need to seek medical attention immediately. Um, yeah. You go to your local ER. Um, I guess to, to expand on that list or just from a, you know, a day to day experience, if you're really have thin bones, right? If you're osteoporotic, 
uh, which I, I think is probably a condition that's under recognized and under treated uh, in kind of the United States. Um, uh, yeah. It kind of gets forgotten a lot. You know, yeah. those might be times where you want to avoid um, a lot of compression uh, type maneuver. So like thoracic spine manipulation in rib uh, manipulation, um, at least in my experience, um, have more of like a, a direct compression type um, moment uh, rather than a rotation sometimes. And in those cases, compression fractures, rib fractures, I've, I've seen that occur um, uh, after uh, manipulation. So if, if you know you have very uh, thin bones and predisposed to, to those types of fractures, you should be use caution as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, one other question I think patients would probably have about chiropractic care is what actually makes the popping noises when the manipulation happens. So what do you know about oh, yeah. that? <laughs> well, that's a good one. I mean, I, I kind of liken it. I could be wrong about this. I kind of liken it to, you know, when you pop your knuckle. I mean, you right. It's the same have, thing. Yeah, you it's have the same thing. A little bit of air in the joint. Um, right. And right, we've talked about the facet joints in in the past. Uh, yeah. And they're they go from the base of your skull all the way down to your sacrum. Um, you have one on each side, uh, and um, you know just kind of that phenomena when when a joint is taken beyond its range of motion, then you, yeah, then you could hear it. Yeah, I think it's like probably slightly more complicated than what we're talking about. Um, and I think the word for it is called cavitation. And so when you kind of, when you apply this force to the joint, it changes the pressure within the joint. And if you go back to high school chemistry, when you change the pressure kind of within a, a compartment, it changes kind of how much fluid versus really gas is in there. And so it produces a little bit of air and it releases that air i believe and that's what pops um but yeah i mean it's probably even more complicated than what i'm describing but it's some kind of release of air within the joint that creates the popping noise and then um that may kind of alleviate some pressure within the joint and maybe part of the reason why you temporarily kind of feel better after the uh after the manipulation is kind of reduced pressure within some of these arthritic joints yeah. I, w I wonder too, if like some of those maneuvers will release like your own body's endorphins. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I think just I like think exercise for sure. I think that's probably part of it. And, and I think that's, you know, you could go to acupuncture too. Why, why does that work for some people? I'm sure that works partially because of, you know, people may release endorphins related to having needles put into their body. So, um, you know, what, whatever may stimulate the release of pain relieving, uh, neurotransmitters within your body, uh, can be helpful for you. And, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure that could, I don't know if it's been studied, but, um, I'm sure yeah, they can study that if it hasn't. All, all medications that are used in different forms of treatment, uh, you know, the term is it's used to modulate your pain, right? It affects your pain at multiple areas along what we call your neuroaxis, axis, whether your spinal cord, brain, or peripheral nerves. This is, again, you have natural occurring chemicals that can help to modulate your pain. And, yeah. you know, like your own body's endorphins and um, yeah. different chemicals that are released in the brain, so... And if we didn't clarify there, it's normal to have those pops when you have an adjustment. <laughs> so it's not abnormal. And Dr. Connor, who mentioned he's an osteopathic physician, if you have an osteopathic physician who manipulates you, you'll probably have the same type of sensation. And, um, and it's normal to have that. Um, but if you have any problems afterwards, like we were previously discussing, um, you should definitely seek medical attention because there are very rare cases of, of severe uh, adverse uh, outcomes. Um, yeah. And, and talk, to, talk to your uh, uh, provider or chiropractor about, you know, the options they have. Are they a one-trick pony? Do they only do the high-velocity, low-amplitude kind of cracking? Do they uh, utilize muscle energy? Um, you know, other kind of soft tissue type techniques um, that can be used uh, in cases where we want to try to avoid the, the manipulation. 
So overall, is there anything else you think we need to go into depth about? No, I think we, we've covered some basic kind of contraindications, which yeah. if you have any questions, right, if you follow with a physician who uh, knows and understands your, your, your spine and, and what's causing your pain, um, you know, ask them their opinions on it. Um, I think that's important to just keep an open line of communication with your primary provider for your spine issues. Let them know all the other avenues or treatment options that you're exploring. Because like you said, there's a lot of different uh, options out there for patients. Um, oh, let me ask you a question though. Yeah. Because I want, I want your opinion. Yeah. What, what do you tell people with like um, when they're having a radicular pain? So pain going down the leg, pain going down the arm. Um, and um, what, what are your feelings on that? Do you, do you have one, like one way or the other about I, chiropractors? I don't find that uh, I get asked about chiropractors for those patients. I would not send those patients to a chiropractor. Um, I wouldn't want the, uh, the, the manipulation component. I think some of the other modalities like... Um, you know, that get used in physical therapy or even in medical offices like hot packs and TENS machine might be useful, but I wouldn't want the manipulation, I don't think, to as a possibility that it might kind of further irritate the nerve that is likely uh, irritated at the time. Um, and I would definitely prefer uh, if it's a lumbar disc herniation or cervical disc herniation and to really see a, a McKenzie physical therapist for those patients. I think those patients, you know, are some of the ones that do the best with physical therapy. So um, that's probably what I would be thinking, but I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, um, I, I would agree, especially if we have MRI documentation of disc herniation with nerve root right. involvement, yeah. um, like the disc is touching a nerve. In those cases, uh, I would definitely say um, I, I would use e extreme caution or if there's really narrow, like a really narrowed foramen where the nerve exits, where it's bone kind of irritating the nerve, mm -hmm. I, tend, I tend to stay away from uh, the manipulation. Um, you know, I, I've even heard and, you know, some chiropractors will do like McKenzie based treatments in their office. They might not just like some of the basic stuff, like yeah. it might not be. They might not be certified, but they know, okay, you do better with extension. So they'll, yeah. they'll put patients in, in those types of uh, extension maneuvers, followed by some of like the more modality type um, treatments. But yeah, you know, so that would, that, that, that would be, that would be good. Um, yeah. But yeah. And that's I, where you have to know the practitioner, you know, that's like, you know, when you're sending someone for spine surgery you send them to someone who you know is gonna do the right surgery when you know we got to think of it the same way you can't we can't just you can't just go see any chiropractor for for any problem you know there's probably people who are better at certain things and like we talked about before i, I don't know too much detail about residency and chiropractic training but i imagine there's probably some kind of more spine related chiropractic training that goes even more in depth into what they learn there's probably like some sports related training also but um yeah i mean i would you know i would lean towards someone with a little more experience with uh with uh with some of these conditions and you know if again like like we talked about before also if so if a chiropractor is using those techniques you're probably going to get much better much faster and that's a good sign that they know what they're doing and are taking great care of you whereas someone who's doing the same thing over and over again you're not feeling better and they keep doing it even though you tell them that you're not feeling better that's a sign that really you need to to try something new yeah. Uh, listen to your body. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're getting better or not, it, it, if somebody tells you, oh, you need 24 visits to feel better. I mean, you know, there, there's no data behind that. Um, and if they're asking you to prepay for a lot of things, you know, red flags should go up. If chiropractors or just any provider really are selling a lot of other things through their office that aren't covered by insurance and that are quite expensive and you know, being 
touted as the latest and greatest. I mean, these are other th- other just kind of red flags. Like, yeah. You know, it doesn't mean you can't explore the option, but just keep the radar up that there might be uh, these people might be more interested in the business side than actual outcomes. Right. Right. So in summary, should you go see a chiropractor? I think the answer is complex. Uh, it's likely safe for you to go see a chiropractor. There are very rare, uh, serious adverse events. Um, and just keep an eye out and make sure that someone's taking good care of you. You know, if you're getting better, great. If, if you're not getting better, you know, see if they can change what they're doing to try to make you better or seek out alternative options. And if you have any questions, um, for us about it, you can reach out to us on our website or our email address. And, uh, uh, you know, we're always happy to help. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. I agree. All right. Good talk.